Let's go through this header. This is a great review for where we've come so far, and it's good to see the perspective where we're heading. And it's also great to understand uh, what, what some of the material we've covered. So far, we've covered about 170 pages into the book. By the time we get to the video next week, um, it's going to be close to about 200, 250 pages of material we've reviewed. So we've gone pretty quickly, but if you look back at what we've covered, it may actually seem to be simple, and that's what this handout's about. So we started the course by reviewing the first class, essentially the different reasons why we're designing reactors. And we said that some kind of environment for reactor volume, but most often we're going to be designing reactors so we can troubleshoot. And we then quickly moved on to the general mole balance equation, which is what's there in step one. So that's our starting point for every batch and CSTR and PFR system. So no matter what the reactor configuration, that general mole balance will always hold. So you'll recognize the terms there. There's in, minus out, plus consumed or generated, depending on which way you want to view it. The sign is equal to the rate of accumulation. And for all the, all the systems we've dealt with so far, PFRs and CSTRs, we've set that accumulation term to zero. It's only for a batch system where we really have truly unsteady state behavior. And we're going to exploit that into ice blocks, that the fact that the batch always has unsteady state behavior. So steady state never, never applies to a batch system. So if we look back then down at step two, you'll notice that right away with the batch system, it's the only equation that has time in the differential dx by dt. All the other systems are not a function of time. They're assumed to operate at steady state. So that's, that's key. And, and like I said, we're going to exploit that in this evening's class. So block number two contains what I call the design equation or the performance equation for the system. It's really the key equation that tells you how the system operates. Now, please note, we do not generally as chemical engineers design reactors. That may seem counterintuitive why it's called the whole introduction to reactor design. Okay. It's also the reason why in the tutorial uh, four that's now due next week, you'll see this pretty tough question three. <coughs> it's not a reactor design question. We're saying we've got an existing reactor and we're going to work with it. That's what most of us will be doing. We will seldom, seldom be designing reactors. And a company that's new and starting off in designing reactors will usually outsource that to an outside consultancy like Hatch, for example. They will design the reactor for you. So very seldom if you're working in a company will you be the person responsible for designing a reactor. So we really must be comfortable with using these equations not to design for volume, which is the usual reactor way we size. And if it's a batch system, we don't design for volume, we design for time. Those two are very seldom done. We will almost always use those equations to solve for some other variable inside it. So we'll usually use those equations in step two to solve for conversion for a given reactor under different kinetics. So, so important to understand what the objective there is in step number two. In step number three, we say, well, let's assume we're given a rate. Then right away, we can go ahead and go across to step number nine and up to n. Okay, so that's what the step uh, three is. Really, it's a key decision point. Do you have enough information to complete your task, yes or no? If you do have that information minus RA as a function of x, then you're ready. Minus RA as a function of conversion. If you've got that data, you're great. We spent then really the last few classes in discussing what the cases where we do not have that. So that's what blocks four and five and six are about. So the past two weeks or so, we've really addressed the case of what happens when I don't know that the reaction rate is a function of conversion. We usually know reaction rate as something like K, CA times CB, maybe to the power of two, for example. That's not in terms of conversion. So we spent the past few classes rewriting CA, CB, and our other concentrations in our system so that we can re-express them in terms of conversion. Step four is, is exactly what that says. Step five says, well, also recognize that in certain conditions, that conversion 
is going to be a function of how the system expands and contracts, especially for gas based systems. So the epsilon factor there comes in into block five. Step seven, we will be addressing in the next class or so, where we're looking at gas phase reactions with pressure drop. Up to now, we considered isobaric reactors. Next class, we'll start to take that assumption away. And as a few people asked in the previous class, well, if you don't have a pressure difference, how do you get flow through the system? Well, for the most part, if you've got an open plug flow reactor, so just simply a hollow tube, you need very few passive differential to get flow moving. But where you really will suffer a pressure drop is the moment you start to fill that plug flow reactor with catalysts. So you've got a packing in there of some sort. Then you absolutely will have a pressure drop. And that's what we're going to look at in the next class. So that covers steps, covers steps seven. Six, five, and four, there are block six combines steps five and four, so we're comfortable with doing that. If you can get your rate expression in terms of conversion, we can go up to step six and then across up to step five. So this table is really important to understand what we've covered in the past few weeks and where we will go for the rest of the course. Another reason why I want to emphasize this table is that traditional reactor design courses do not follow this approach. So for example, when I learned reactor design in undergrad, reactors, we had it split over one full year, reactor design one, reactor design two. It's the equivalent of 3K and 4K here at MAC. What happens is we've ended up with a list of equations, and you just have to figure out which equation applies in which condition. So for a first order reaction in a gas phase that's not isothermal, use this equation. For a second order reaction that's in a gas phase with no expansion, use the next equation. It was really, you come out of that course just trying to know which equation applies to where. The purpose of Fogler's book and why we've selected it for this course is so you don't have to do that. And that's really not, not what you should be doing ever as an engineer, memorizing equations, because that's why we have paper to look up the paper. What you should be understanding is how to follow a systematic approach. And that was why last class I had that list of steps to follow. So when you ever solve the problem, the first step is to define it, then explore it. And the very first thing is to plan, plan your strategy. That's the same. Okay? So this is step three in that overall approach, where the first step was to define your problem. What am I trying to solve? What is known and what is not known? Explore your problem. Or your classes on that. Step three then was this crucial planning step before you get into this fourth step, which is where most people try to start. Most people jump right ahead and start to solve the problem and plug into equations and put over the That's not our objective. Our objective here is to actually follow a systematic approach. And this table here called uh, flow sheet you have in front of you is that crucial planning step. That's going to guide you how to solve pretty much every problem we'll be looking at as looking at as engineers. Okay, so please keep that. That's all I'm going to talk about this table in, in this evening's class. So keep that aside. That's an important guide for all, all future problems we're going to address. The next thing I'd like to look at is the tutorial four. So the tutorial form has four questions. Only questions one, two, and three are due as uh, at class next week Monday. Previously, I had it all four questions were due. I changed that down to just the first three questions. I recognize that there's a lot of other midterms and uh, due dates that you've got in your other courses. So let's let's reduce that down to a little bit more manageable size. That's due in class on Monday. I'll post the solutions Monday night. No, no late handings will be accepted after the class on Monday next week. Um, then the midterm is on Wednesday. As I said, it's here in this room. You can bring whatever materials you like with you to the midterm. And it's also optional. If you don't write the midterm, your final exam counts more. However, that raises the stakes incredibly high for you because remember, this course has got a 50% minimum on the final exam. So you don't want to mess up. Um, that way. So rather like the midterm and spread out the, the stress and spread out the load across multiple multiple submissions. But I do want to talk about question three. Question three is a tough question in this current tutorial. It really, really frustrates me when I read reactor design books and every single problem in the back of the chapter are design the reactor. What's the volume for? 
how big does the reactor need to be under such and such conditions? What a lot of shit. Right? Most of the time, as I said, we're going to be troubleshooting as engineers. We're going to not be building new materials and new reactors from scratch. Most of the time, we've got an existing problem that we have to face. So question three comes from a real problem that I looked at um, when I was working in Glaxo, where what you recognize is most companies have multiple reactors on site. They install these units, they spend a lot of time and money getting these vessels in place. When they're designing to run a new product, what very seldom happens is that companies say, well, let me buy a new reactor for this new product. The first thing they do is say, can we do it with our existing capacity? Because that is so, so much more efficient than buying a new reactor. You have to build a, a room for it. You have to add piping, instrumentation. There's a long lead time for that. If you can do it in an existing unit, you can beat your competitor to market right away because you can use your existing tank or vessel that you've got there in place. So in question three, you're doing that. And your boss is saying to you, well, look, you've got this 1,800 meter vessel. Just conveniently here. And the vessel is already instrumented so that it's got an entry and an exit piping. There's also a jacket or some form of heating and cooling on that vessel so that you can, come to, can operate it at a constant temperature. Recognize that this is a well-mixed reactor. If I close these valves, the inlet and the outlet, it's a batch reactor. If I open those valves and operate it at steady state, it's a CSTR. Two reactors, one vessel. I can choose how to operate it. In continuous flow mode, it's a CSTR. Close those valves, it's a batch reactor. Which one do you pick? Is it batch or do you use CSTR? That's your first problem. Do I operate it in batch mode or do I operate it in continuous mode? So there are your two choices. When you make that choice, you immediately have the design equations or the performance equations for each one of them. That's given to you right on this tape, on this flow sheet. So I can read for that, the performance equation here there is Na0, dx by dt is equal to Ra times the volume d. That's this volume of the reactor over here. It's fixed. You bought the reactor, it's installed, that volume is fixed. In continuous flow mode as a CSTR, the volume V is equal to FA0 times the conversion you choose over minus RA. Again, as a CSTR, that volume is fixed. So batch equations, if I operate, if I choose to look at it in batch mode. Here are my choices. Let's come, let's, let's, before we evaluate my choices, let's just step back and look at what my goal is. My goal is to maximize the amount of product I produce here, D. I've got A and I've got B coming in. And I'm producing D. Sorry, I forgot to go over this. I just assumed all of you were in the tutorial. I just recognize half of you. You know, have, may not have seen this question yet, but A plus B is going to D. So that's the problem we're facing. And we want to maximize the production of D. The key thing you have to recognize is that when you run this in continuous mode or in batch mode, coming out here at the end is not pure D. There's also unreacted A and B. So whether I operate in batch mode or continuous mode, I always will have unreacted raw materials coming out. Any product we produce, we're going to get that blend of, of, of our species coming out. I need to sell D to my customer. My customer is not interested in receiving A and B. So I have to then go to some form of separation step, and it might be a distillation column. And that distillation column might pull off A and B at the top and B coming out at the bottom. Or it might be a membrane, or it might be some form of sedimentation vessel depending on the nature of A, B, or D. But this separation step here, that's not what this course is about. That's what your 3M and 4M courses are about. But this 
is going to cost you money as well. If I can get close to pure D coming out of that reactor, I spend less money down here. You put high concentrations of A and B mixed in with this D, you're going to have to spend more money. Okay, so we really want to maximize our purity of D. Another way of saying that is you want to maximize your conversion of A. You increase your conversion of A, you've got less A and B to deal with coming out of the, at the reactor. Okay, so now we're back to our two decisions here. Batch or continuous? We have to evaluate both. We don't know which one is going to work for us. There's no rule that says for first order reactions, batches are the way to go. For second order reactions, this is the way to go. There's no such rule. Always have to evaluate both. What are our degrees of freedom here? What can we vary? What can I, in a batch process, what can I change? Number of moles, any moles? Time. What else is there that I can vary? If I change the temperature, the rate can vary. Concentrations. There's conversion as well, x. So if I run the batch for longer, I'll get greater conversions. This problem conveniently eliminates temperature from the degrees of freedom for us. It says that you have to operate at 25 C. So we're fixed to be isothermal. So that takes out the temperature dependence of the rate. But RA is also a function of concentration. In this particular problem, our laboratory has determined for us that minus RA is equal to KCA. We can re-express CA in terms of conversion. That's exactly what this flow chart is telling you to do in step number three. Write the rate expression in terms of conversion. So really my degrees of freedom come down to be how long do I run the reactor and conversion. The longer you run the reactor, the greater the conversion. Shorter the run, the lower the conversion. So you really have to, those are, those are your trade-offs. Yeah. Also, the question, don't be, don't be misled by the 12-hour time limit. The, the reason for me specifying is 12 hours is that's the duration of a typical industrial shift. It's 12 hours and many companies. So what I'm after you to do is just to find out in any time duration, but here I've marked it down to 12 hours, how much D can you produce? You don't have to run one batch of 12 hours. You could run, for example, two batches of six hours, or 12 batches lasting one hour each. Okay, so there's no correct one way of, of approaching this side of the flow sheet. You can answer this question in many different ways. Okay, and that's exactly why the problem reads Describe clearly and concisely to your operators how to produce product D. What I mean by that is if you choose to go the batch route, you must tell your operators, put this much A into the reactor, put this much B into the reactor, run it for a certain amount of time, enter the reactor, and then that is how much D you will get out. That's what your answer needs to look like. Put in A, put in B of this amount, run it for X duration, you will get this conversion, and you'll get this amount of D being produced. And you can be as short or as long in duration as you want to be. So that covers the batch mode. What if you want to run it in continuous mode? What are your degrees of freedom now? Flow and conversion. Do you want to explain the trade-offs there? Okay, so there's definitely a trade-off there. Volume is fixed. I can't change my volume. The FA, the flow of A, and conversion X trade off on each other. For this to remain fixed, I can either operate at high flow and low conversion, or I can operate at low conversion and high flow. Again, how much do you flow do you operate this reactor? You've got to be specific to your operator. Run the batch with this amount of A flowing into it, with this amount of B flowing into it, and then you will get such and such amount of D flowing out. They're totally up to you to choose what those flows need to be in order to achieve a certain conversion x. And this, so this problem has no correct answer. There's no single answer that will get you full grade. This answer requires you to understand what <coughs> the reactor is doing, what's going on inside it, and to recognize the trade-offs between operating more efficiently here 
and then you don't have to separate. Or you can operate less efficiently in this reactor, but then spend more on your separation step. Okay, so pretty open-ended. Your answer should be one where you present multiple scenarios to your boss or to your engineering team, not just a single option saying this is how to do it. Okay, because there isn't just one way of doing it. So this is a very, very typical problem or something you will face. You, you will probably, most of you in this class will never design a reactor from scratch, but almost all of you, if you're working in an engineering company, will have to work on an existing reactor and alter the operating mode. Either run a new product in it, or run an existing product in it at slower flow rate, higher flow rates, low temperatures, higher temperatures, different catalyst A versus different catalyst B. So those are, t those are far more realistic actual problems that you will face. So let's, Let's see more of those in the tutorials, more of those in the midterms, more of those in the final exams, and not the, the rubbish that you see at the back of the textbook. Okay? So, any questions on that, 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 that one for the tutorial? Yeah. Because it's operating in steady state. So it's just within a 12 hour period, how much product E would you have produced if you're operating at a certain flow? And that's why I chose a 12 hour period, so you can make a fair comparison between one versus the other. Okay, so pick the method that will get you the highest production amount in a, in, a, in a fixed time. That's always what companies want to do. A company that can maximize the production in the shortest time frame is the company that wins. Okay, so this evening's class then we're focusing on step number three and four essentially in that flow chart in front of you. Up to now, you've been told what your reaction rate constant K is. We're going to start to investigate how that K is determined. So this material comes from, if you've got the old folder, it's from chapter 4. If you've got the newer one, it's from chapter 5. our rate expressions. For one reason, a batch reactor does not operate at steady state. It means that you can get all your experimental data that you need in one run, in one single operation. <coughs> CSTR operates at one reaction rate. It operates at constant steady state at a single reaction rate at a single conversion. If you wanted to use a CSTR to obtain your, batch react, uh, your reaction rate expression, you have to operate at CSTR at multiple different steady states. A batch reactor is going to get you different operating points for free because by definition it's not a steady state unit. So let's take a look at that. There's another important reason why we would like to use batches because for liquid phase systems we have V is equal to V naught for most cases. And if we're running gases in a, in a batch system, the gas is going to occupy the entire volume V, so V is equal to V naught anyway. Okay, so I'll use that term always have V equals V naught only in the most exceptional cases where you've got a batch reactor whose volume can expand, um, which is almost no practical batch reactors have. So we like this because batch systems are going to simplify for us using the control. So let's uh, do this by an example. Let's recap. So 2A goes to B plus C. And if we look at our mole balance, we have look at that table in front of you in block two, we have dnj by dt is equal to the rate 
of j multiplied by b. Let's use a as my species that I'm considering. So na is equal to na0 minus na0 x. So in my batch reactor, I will always have na moles of a is what I start off with minus what I react with. So if I, if I differentiate that, I can show DNA is equal to minus NA0 dx. So this allows me to sub that in there. So for, this is the point where Fogler starts. He doesn't recap that for you. Fogler starts right away and simply says NA0 by dt is equal to minus Ra times B. But he doesn't really tell you where it comes from. It comes from this initial balance we derived right in the first week of the course. We use this fact that what we have left over is equal to N minus what reacts and we differentiate that. And since B is equal to B naught, I can just add a subscript zero there as well. Recognize that CA is equal to CA naught is equal to NA naught over V naught as well. And so if I use that, I can write now the X by DT is equal to minus RA over CA naught. Simply substituting in NA naught here in terms of concentration. <coughs> And I can simplify that derivative of time. Now the purpose that of this evening's class is to show you where these rate constants come from, but also to actually explore the values of these rates. What does it mean for a system to have a high reaction rate versus a low reaction rate? What does it mean, for example, on Friday I had the privilege to visit the Xerox Research Laboratory in Mississauga, where they do exactly what we're going to describe now. They have about, I think it's about 20 batch reactors, which they run <coughs> five days a week, every day, hour of the day, and only do batch experiments to determine rates and new experimentation for, for polymers. So, when they run these reactors, what does it mean, for example, when, when the guy leading the plant just says to us, this is a reaction rate limited system, or this system is basically an equilibrium system, it's not limited by, by the rate. Let's explore what some of these reaction rate values are and, and what their meaning is. So let's assume And I'm going to use a subscript 2 there to emphasize that this is the second order reaction rate constant. I'll use K subscript 1 in a minute. And we know then that CA is equal to CA naught 1 minus A. We derived that last, last time. So using that, I can sub into that expression that I've got over here on the chalkboard, dx by dt is equal to k2 ca0 squared 1 minus x squared over ca0. <coughs> and I can integrate that between the usual limits of 0 to x and 0 to t. <coughs> so if I integrate that, I can write integrate from x equals 0 to x equals x dx 1 minus x squared that's equal to k2 ca0 those come out the integral being constant from time 0 to time tr I'll call that tr my batch reaction time this is the total time I run my batch reactor for Reactor operating time. 
That's the time you tell your operators from the moment they turn on the impeller and start the system, the system becomes well mixed, till the time they turn it off, that's TR. So it's how long do you run the reactor. And if you do that integral, you can show that TR is equal to X over K2 CA0 1 minus X. So we can solve for the time that you should run the reactor to obtain a given conversion. I know my conversion x that I would like to see, and I know my rate constants, I can see <coughs> how long I should run the graph. <coughs> if it's a second order with that structure, yeah. <coughs> I will add here, let's take a look also at the first order reaction rate. For example, if <coughs> minus RA is equal to K1CA, you can, you can follow that exact same procedure and show that TR is equal to 1 over the reaction rate constant K1 times the log of 1 over 1 minus X. And that over there on the other side in red is for a second order system. So same derivation, just repeat it, subbing in a different expression for the rate. <coughs> now the purpose of this is to compare these two systems. to have a reaction time of about 6.4 hours. So what we're trying to establish here is what does it mean for K1 to be equal to 10 to the minus 4? Well, that's a pretty slow reaction rate. To obtain a 90% conversion, you have to wait 6.4 hours to, to get there. You may look up and find that K1, <coughs> the reaction rate constant, is in the order of 1 second. So this, these units are 10 to the 4 seconds to the power minus 1. So now if I have the rate constant of k of 1 second uh, to the minus 1, to achieve, obtain a conversion of 90%, I would need to run that batch for only 2.3 seconds. No, this is for this first order system here in blue. So the blue here on this side is for first order. So let's we want to emphasize that in the notes, this is for first order. Okay, so only 2.3 seconds are required. In fact, you probably wouldn't even run this in a batch because the reaction rate is so rapid, you would run this in a CSTR or in a bug flow reactor. Batch wouldn't make sense here. But you're getting the purpose is to interpret what these K1 values mean. Let's take a look at this side for the second order system, what how we can interpret the K2 values. specify CA0. I'm going to use the base case of one mole per liter. If you want to achieve a 90% conversion, you'd have to wait 25 hours. It's a similar rate constant, same conversion, 
you have to wait a longer time. Another example is if K2 was equal to 1, same units, meters per mole per second. Is really different that it's the second in the order? This is what, yeah, we're comparing first order to second order. We'll see the, the reaction rates change. So CA0 here is again 1 mole per liter. <coughs> we're looking for 90% inversion. That takes 90 seconds. So in all cases, higher numbers for that reaction rate constant means that you get shorter times. Reaction procedure is really rapid, okay, which is why we also call it the reaction rate constant. The rate of the reaction, small numbers, low rates, higher numbers, very rapid rates. You don't have to wait for a, lot, for a long time in that batch reactor. So what we do is to determine those reaction rates. So how to determine So step one is to assume a reaction expression. For example, I'm going to assume minus RA is equal to KCA. We assume that it's first order. If we're wrong, we'll go to second order, or third order. So we start simple, assume first order. The next step is add catalysts and reactants the reactor and start mixing. <laughs> what you do then is measure concentration against time. By definition, a batch is unsteady state. It's going to change as time evolves. So your concentrations will definitely change as time evolves. For example, you'll collect a table as follows. That has time. And concentration. Let's consider the case where in this example, A is going to E plus D. So absolutely I can measure A, or I can measure more conveniently I can measure C in, in many cases. My product might be more me easily measurable. So I could set up a table, for example, at time 0 minutes, 1 minute, 2 minutes, 5 minutes, 10 minutes, etc. And I could measure the corresponding values of CA, CD at those time instants. Or CD, yeah. The, I'm, just, I'm illustrating either a reagent or a product. Yeah, you only need to measure one.
So I've collected a, a table of, of time-based data versus concentration data. Now I come back to my, my batch performance expression. 1 over the volume times DNA by T is equal to RA. Or I can write that in terms of concentration. DCA is RA. Either one of those. Uh, the first equation leads to the second equation. Recognize here is that CD, I can write it in terms of conversion with respect to CA0, but I can also write it as CD is equal to the number of moles of D divided by the volume. That's equal to NA0 times X over the volume. Well, that's also equal to NA0, the number of moles of A minus the, I start off with, minus the number of moles at the end over the volume which is equal to CA0 minus CA. Okay, so this is an important relationship. <coughs> we can often express the kind of concentration of the product species in terms of the change in concentration of the food species. Provided we're operating at constant volume, which is by definition in a batch, we are. It's one of the reasons why we've selected a batch system is because the volume remains constant through time, even for gas-based systems. It's a totally enclosed volume. So, so let's come back here to this performance equation. Uh, to this performance equation here. And we've got this estimate, or, or this hypothesis, I should say, that the rate is equal to minus R rate is ACA. So, <coughs> so if minus R rate is equal to KCA, substitute that into that differential equation. And I will obtain then that CA, we've seen this equation before early on in the course, CA is CA naught e to the minus kt. That's your usual first order equation that shows how concentration diminishes over time, starting from CA naught, it reduces down and reduces down depending on how big that rate constant is. Now, knowing that CD is related to CA, I can write CD CA naught minus CA. Well, that's equal to CA naught one minus e to the minus k. So the log of C 
be ignored. Why is the concentration of E over C A naught is equal to minus K A? Now I've got a table of time, I've got a concentration of D values at several time points. I add a new column here, a column that is log of CA0 minus CD over CA0. And I can do that quite easily because of course I know what CA0 is. I, I added a certain amount of material at the start of my batch. So CA0 is something I know. So this column here is easily, easily calculated. And I will plot then on my y-axis and my x-axis time and that term respectively, and the slope will be equal to minus Ka. So let's just illustrate that over here on this side. Time zero, CD is going to be equal to zero. So this is the log of CA naught over CA naught. The log of one is zero. So your first data point will be at the intercept at time zero. Your second and subsequent data points will fall on a straight line, roughly, with experimental error. If you, if this system really is a first order system. So if you guess correctly. Second order expression and it will fall in a straight line. Okay. So we will we'll come to this point again in a later chapter. The key is that it's very much an iterative guessing check. Assume a certain reorder, reaction order, integrate, and this is why when we get to this later on, we'll call this the integral method. But you have to do this integration first and then plot. 